5% what he has. <laughs> I haven't helped him on this one. <laughs> so you can see him expert. Good afternoon. Welcome to Harvard and our lecture series. Um, for the last one and a half years, we have been trying to make a journey on a series called Indian Languages and Literature. We started 2006 December with Sanskrit. We moved to Hindi. Urdu, Gujarati, Nepali, and then we broke for the summer, and again we started this year with Marathi, Bengali, Punjabi, and last month, Kashmiri. So we are in our 10th lecture today. You will see, we call it different parts. Parts by Harvard standard as a semester. So we have four part series, each consisting of three to four lectures. So this is the first lecture of the fourth part. Now Sindhi. Sindhi is not only an interesting language, it's the language of an interesting people. India was known to the world when it was a colony by the Indus Valley. Indus Valley put the India's name among the civilizations of the world. Presently, however, there's been a lot of debate about what Indus Valley was, who the people were, what did they do, and most of all, did the right. Even though we have a lot of artifacts from the place, people have not been able to decipher them well. There are two schools. One school thinks that they're only symbols. Other school from India think they can read. Why this is important? It's important because the people who lived in Indus Valley should be the original Indians who became later on Vedic Indians or what we call modern Indians. But that connection can't be done well. So there we come to the land of Sindh the land of Sindhu, as Dr. Dani will say, and Sindhu becoming Indus River, and Indus becoming India, and I occasionally being identified as a Hindu. All this has this origin in this little land called Sindhu. So we are thankful that we have a Sindhi scholar with us, a local person, a patriot of India, a patriot of the United States, who has been practicing medicine and has been active in literature and languages for all his life. Sindhi people are very interesting, I said in the beginning, that is they're enterprising. Sindhi people from Indus Valley, they were from, on, from Babylon to Caspian, they had a whole spread of trades route. So the language itself had developed probably with huge influence from various cultures. Later on, when Islamic people came, that culture was further influenced by Arabic, Persian, 
and uh, Turkish influences. So now what we are going to see is the history of this people through its language. And I learned they have an alphabet now which has been developed about 100 years uh, ago or what 19th century. So we have a celebration of this language, culture, and, and people. Interestingly again, Sindhis as we know are spread all over the world. And Dr. Dani just told me that he was born in Sindh and migrated to India. And many of you probably had the similar kind of history. So with celebration of the Sindhi people who have maintained their tradition and language and literature over the time, and who have given the genesis of Indian civilization, we celebrate today the Sindhi language and literature. And as I said before, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Dani with us, whom I know for many, many years, about 20 plus years, as a friend, as a mentor, as an athlete, as a poet. And we have many of you who are here who also have celebrated Sindhi in the past. In the format of our lectures, we will, um, Dr. Dani uh, has a good friend, Mr. Parwani, a young man, a young man who is helping him in the lecture. And we have a lecture format. After the lecture, there will be short recitations about the portions of the literature, how the literature, how the language is heard. And then we will open it for questions. So please use this forum informal, learn it. If you can contribute, do add wherever you think you have more knowledge or you think you have a comment, please don't hesitate. Treat it as an educational forum so we all learn from it. These lectures are done on behalf of the Department of Science and Indian Studies where we try to educate ourselves about the research that we might undertake in future years. So in that, you are a part, and I thank you for coming today. The next month, we will go to Vedic literature, and I will mention about that once we finish this lecture today. So let us now welcome to Dr. Dudani. Dr. Dudani's wife is here somewhere, and Prakash Parwani, the family Dudani's and Parwani for the lecture. Thank you all for coming, Dr. Dudani. Thank you, Dr. Mishra, for that introduction. Today's lecture, I shall divide into following sections. It will be introduction, then I'll touch the ancient times, turbulent history of Sindh, and the structure of Sindhi language, then the Sindhi Sufism, followed by Sindhi as a state language, in, from 1852, then post-independence, Sindhi language and the literature, and finally, the recitation of the alphabet and a little bit of Sindhi music, if you have the time. In Sindhi, welcome, Bhali Kare Aya. The presentation is by myself and Prakash Parwani. On behalf of both of us, and Sindhi community, my thanks to Harvard University, Department of Sanskrit and Indian Languages, and Dr. Vijay Mishra, Professor Gopinath, for giving Sindhi this opportunity. For us here, it is in the same vein, when in 1967, Sindhi, Sindhis in India thanked the people and the government of India for including Sindhi as one of the national languages of India. We would appreciate if the queries, comments, and questions are reserved to the end of the presentation. We would not want to break the continuity of our thoughts. Sindhi was spoken by about 25 million in Sindh, out of which about 3 million were in India and about half a million scattered all over the world. In ancient times, Early in 1920s, excavation of, at Mohanjo Daro near Larkana 
which is uh, also my birthplace, revealed a large metropolis with, with all brick structures, well-led city, a textile and other manufacturing center, trading with many overseas and overland regions. Even then, major portion still remains to be excavated with undeciphered script after 60 years plus of independence. It's a tragedy. There were three cities rebuilt on top of the ruins of the previous cities, all at the same spot, thus estimated to have lasted more than 800 years at the same spot. Many artifacts relieve, reveal, sorry, reveal relationship to the existing society and I'm sure to the existing Sindhi language. The deciphering may be easier if the experts concentrate on the Sindhi language also, which uh, to my knowledge, they have not done fully yet. This was followed by Rig Veda, which sings the glory of Sindhu River as a mighty male deity, as a vast sea, as a powerful river with very prosperous hinterland and all along, all along its banks. It's a literal admiration for the nature and human development in Rigveda. Sanskrit is a refined, as a literary language, must have had a form that common people used in those times. What was that? That's for the research people to find out. Later on, we come to Puranic area. The region gets noted when Shiva carried the corpse of his wife Sati the Sindur or the vermilion from, from her head fell at Hinglaj. And Hinglaj is west of present Karachi in Sin. Here an ancient temple of Hinglaj still exists, though in a dilapidated condition. Later on, Ramayan mentions the region of Sindhu and in Mahabharat, the Jayadarth as prince of Sindhu Desh, at the behest of his wife Dushala. Her brother Duryodhan had dispatched 30,000 Brahmins in those days to Sindh. In those days, it was also called Papapurna Pradesh. That is probably fond of uh, music, fun, and everything else. Maybe because Jayadarth had sided with Duryodhan and was killed, Sindh fell into neglect and disrepute. After that, we find that the Old Testament mentions in the book of Esther that the region was annexed by Achaemenian Empire under King Darius and was called Hudu and Hindaki. In Hebrew, that means fragrance. So the prosperity of region was even known in those days. Alexander defeated the Persians and after confrontation with King Poro, devastated its sin, ma massacring all the teachers, Brahmins, and destroying arts, literature, and everything they, he could get hold of because the king had not listened, accepted his advice or surrendered to him. Later in Vikram area of the Ujjain rulers, annexed southeast portion of Sindh sending again teachers Brahman to the region in the first century BC. It was in 500 AD or so that Sindh was brought back in the fold by Sahasi Rajput rulers from Arabian Sea to Kashmir, the United Sindh. In early 8th century, the holy Jain scriptures speak of Sindhi as an elegant with a lovely soft and slow gait. It says their people are fond of songs, music, dance, and feel affection for their country. So this checkered history was followed by turbulent times and the tiding of uh, history left Sindh in turmoil for centuries. The year 711 A.D. was fateful when the Arabs finally conquered Sindh and after innumerable attempts in previous decades. They eliminated, eliminated most of the upper classes, destroying the temples, the arts, culture, and literary institution. 
And for next 150 years, they left Sindh in chaos, chaos with no central authority as they did in other places from Baghdad. The Arab generals who were left behind, the preachers and their lackeys with no uh, ruled different parts of Sindh in their own chaotic way. The legend of the reincarnation of Varuna, the ocean form of Lord Vishnu, was born in the early 10th century as Oderolal Julelal, worshipped by Hindus to this day. He inspired Hindus to stand up, fight an overwhelmed, overwhelmed op oppressive Muslim ruler to the relief of all common people, both Hindus and Muslims combined. Sindhis regained their self-confidence. Hindu traders who had ships sailing to the Gulf and whole of coastal India prospered, and later day, Shah Latif eulogized their courage and the longing of women left behind in his Sur Samundi compositions. The scholars generally agree that mid 10th century was the time when Sindhi assumed its modern form. It was towards the end of the century that Rajput princes converted to Islam, consolidated Sindh under their rule, ushering in not only political consolidation, economic prosperity, but great renaissance of Sindhi language. The popular folklore of romantic tales are related to that period. They were all immortalized later in the poetry of Shah Abdul Latif. The blossom, blossoming of Sindhi continued for another 250 years or so with no written records, however. And that you will understand from what followed by, uh, with history's tribulation for sin. The reasons for absence of any written literature are obvious. The history has been replete with invasions and occupation of Sindh by Shakas, Kushans, Sasanians, Huns, Walker Wandering, Scythians, Gurjars, and so on. Barring the last, last few tribes who merged with the local population and settled in Sindh, others were brutal, destroying whatever existed in the form of institutions, art, and literature. They were followed by Afghans, Arguns, Tarakhans, who did the same, and finally Mughals under Akbar, Sindh once again was consolidated at least a govern, governing region. But in, 19, in 1737, Nadir Shah dealt deathly blow to the Mughal Empire, looting the whole region of Northwest. From Sindh and adjoining regions, he took away the dancers, the musician tribes that came to be called Gypsy in Europe, designated by UNICEF, now as of Indian origin. Thus, it was no wonder that there were no written records of Sindhi literature. Following the devastation, Sindh came to be ruled by indigenous Muslim rulers, but they made Farsi as their state language. They frowned on Sindhi language and writers and composers. Strangely, these rulers would not trust Muslim scholars in Farsi Instead, they brought in Hindu traders who were expert in Farsi. These Sindhi traders from Upper Sindh and Multan region had established extensive trade and financial institutions in Central Asia from 12th century until the advent of British, stretching from China to Rome. Recent publications from Russian archives have revealed that part of history. These Sindhi Hindu traders ran the treasury and administration for the Muslim rulers who gave them the title of Amils. They became a privileged class of Hindus and contributed very greatly to advancement of Sindhi literature. Sindhi flowered among common people, poets who were mostly Muslim in those days, but initiated and followed the tenets of Bhaktivad or monotheistic devotional uh, composition in their, in their poems, even in early 15th century. Recently, Dr. Motilal Jotwani, who came to Harvard also for a year's uh, attachment, he, he has uh, unearthed some of those uh, manuscripts from Agra and other places. Their poetry, like that of others who came later, 
expresses the craving of a female for male supreme being and was based on classical source of Hindustani music. The structure of Sindhi language. The British developed interest in Sindh, Sindh and Sindhi language prior to their conquest of Sindh in 1843. They spurred the study of Sindhi by missionaries, military, and civil service personnel. Richard Byrd, Ernest Trump, George Scott, and others were the Orientalists. They all agreed that Sindhi belonged to the family of Sanskrit and Prakrit languages. Trump, a Lutheran missionary from Germany, later published Sindhi grammar, concluding that Sindhi was much closer to Prakrit than Marathi, Hindi or Bengali, and had preserved abundance of grammatical structure that its subtlety of execution and inner strength by far surpasses the loose construction of other languages. The rules which grammatician Kramadeshwar laid down for Abhramasha can be clearly recognized in Sindhi language of today, he said. In 1851, Richard Burton in his book stated, it may safely be asserted that no vernacular dialect in India at that time of overtaking the country possessed more and few so much original composition. It is this inner strength and solid grammatical structure that has preserved Sindhi language through the millennia of vicious occupation and destruction of its civilization, arts, and culture. The closeness of Sindhi to Sanskrit has been explored and acknowledged by many Indian scholars since independence. Mr. Kadapan was also a member of the parliament in 1966, and while speaking on the bill for inclusion of Sindhi as a national language, he said, Sindhi is one of the most ancient languages. As a student of languages, its origin was even before Sanskrit in this country. Later on, Suniti Kumar Chatterjee stated, the Sindhi was the product of Indo-Aryan language or Prakrit of Middle Ages. Sindhi has preserved the signs of all the stages of old Indo-Aryan, mid-Indo-Aryan, and neo-Indo-Aryan languages. These are quotations of Trump and others are from Professor Anne-Marie Schmel, Dr. Popati Hiranandani, and Dr. Motilal Tejwani. Jotwani, I'm sorry. I'll give few examples. In Sanskrit, the word is anas. In Sindhi, it is anaso, anas, anasi, which is same. And it is a kind, in Sanskrit, it was a contemptuous for a non-Aryan person, whereas in Sindhi it is used in a way contemptuously also for lazy, crude, or thick-skinned person. Milk, the word milk in Sindhi is kheer, and so it is in pre-Vedic Sanskrit, whereas in other Indian languages, kheer becomes a sweet dish made from milk. In Sindhi, for the rain, we say me. Vedic is meh. Classical Sanskrit is meg. In Sindhi, old is jur. In Vedic is jure. In classical Sanskrit is jiran. Kishinchan Jetli translated one couplet from Shah Latif into Sanskrit. In Sindhi, it is Vagar kayo vatan prit nachinan paname pasu pakhiyadan manhua met gano. He says that uh, birds and the animals flock together and they have more sweetness among themselves. They stick together compared to human beings. In Sanskrit, as Jetli wrote, Vagar kirtava bartante pritara nachindant atamsu Manave Bhayo Mishthan Ganam. 
excuse my <laughs> pronunciation. Now, there's certain special characteristics of Sindhi which uh, Trump uh, and others have pointed out. Trump says the Sindhi has pronominal suffixes which occur in verbs having concurred together either with the subject or the recipient. And Trump further says the use of suffixes constitutes quite a special peculiar feature of the Sindhi language and distinguished it advantageously from the kindred idiom of Indian languages which are destitute of pronominal suffixes. Because of the suffixes, a single word give us the meaning of a whole sentence in Sindhi. And these words are like kerayayins, otharayayins, sumharayayins, maryayins, chichlayayins, which that this was all done uh, to the person and left behind. So the whole sentence comes in one word. George, George Scott observed, I was hitherto proud of the English language as I consider more beautiful and very copious language in the world. But it was very vain of me. When I learned Sindhi, I found reduplicated causal verb and other points that gave to Sindhi beauties distinct from most Indian languages. Sindhi uses both tatsam, which is without phonetic modification, and tadbhav, which is borrowed from Sanskrit, and Arabic and Farsi languages like attar, ittur, both words are accepted. Mutak, mukut. Sindhi also has a vocal finals. When we call, when we write in Hindi, Ram, in Sindhi we write as Ram, Gopal, Gopalu. And also Sindhi has four implosive words. N not words, uh, the al alphabet is uh, four implosive. All these four are present in Sindhi languages, whereas in other Indian languages, it is only one or two. These are, when we deal with the alphabet, we should describe more, but I'll pronounce them. These are B, D, G, G. All four are present in Sindhi language. From there, we'll, we'll take you to, through the sections of Sindhi Sufism. Why we call it Sindhi Sufism? Because Sindhi poets, largely Muslims, who combine the classical Islamic Sufism with Vedanta and, and, and the whole new uh, category of called Sindhi Sufism arises. It combines the Advait Vedanta with the Vahdat al wujud philosophy of Sufism. The devotional poetry in Sindhi has been known since early 15th century at least. However, from mid 18th to mid 19th century, so much and so rich, so such a rich compositions were created, blending Vedic Vedantic thoughts with Sufism that Sindhi Sufism was born. Shah Latif, the principal poets of this uh, at that time, who roamed the subcontinent for more than three years, in company of sannyasis, yogis, bairagis, brought together the essence of Islam with that of Gita. He utilized the romantic folk tales of Sindh to compose enchanting poetry of a craving for a supreme being by a devotee in a female form. A poet becomes a female form. And hence, he based most of his poetry he, uh, took, uh, on classical Hindustani music. And he was known as an unflinching symbol of simplicity. I feel whatever I could uh, collect, the uh, following shlok from Gita expresses the characteristics of a devotee. Devotee who is, uh, uh, who expresses belief in monotheistic devotion. It is from chapter 12, Shalok 13 and 14. Advesta sarva bhutana maitra karuna eva cha 
निर्मोह निरंकार सम दुख सुख किशमी संतुष्ट सततम योगी यतात्मा दृढ़ निश्चय मय अर्पित मनो बुधिर मद भक्त समय प्रिय Okay let let me do it is that uh, it's a person is selfless person has no bias against others person is friendly and compassionate to everybody and so such a uh, person who uh, who's uh, steady in the uh, in the happiness or sorrow and he is without any uh, egoistic or uh, attachment and he always remains calm and he such a person is very dear to me uh, krishna says to arjuna so i think that uh, that expresses the uh, character of uh, any devotee or any poet who is uh, uh, who is devoted to monotheism and the devotion and he becomes a devotee of uh, supreme being the rasa- rasalo or the compilation of the work of shah abdul latif which was initially done by dr trump and later improved upon and more was collected by dr gurbakshani in the early 20th century and also then dr Adva- kalyan advani later in the 1970s shah abdul latif starts his uh, rasalo with a uh, quotation with his couplet which is uh, to my mind it is a translation from the first chapter of uh, quran sharif and in uh, other subsequent Uh, the compositions in the same sur kalyan sur kalyan and yaman kalyan he he gets a, uh, he borrows from gita so i'll recite both of them first will be the uh, first one as uh, shah abdul latif says i'll recite it and he will yeah. g- give you a gist of it in english avali allahu ali आलम जो धणी कादर पहजे कुदरत सी कायम आह कदी वाली वाहिद वहद हु राज को रब रही सो सारा है सचो धणी चवे हमद हकीम करे पाण करी jodyo jod jahan ji in name of supreme being lord of the universe nature's creator since eternity from what i feel is which other stanzas which is which I'll, i'll recite two three stanzas at a time and he'll give you gist of it in english these are from uh, chapter 7 shalok 6 8 9 26 of uh, gita and also chapter 2 shalok 28 and chapter 10 shalok 8 but i'll recite this on, only in sindhi panhi jallu jalal panhi jaan jamal panhi jallu jalal पाणी जान जमाल पाणी सूरत पीरिय जी पाणी सूरत पीरिय जी पाणी हुसन कमाल पाणी पीर मुरी दुथिए पाणी पीर मुरी दुथिए पाणी पाण खयाल सब सबोई हाल मंझाई मालूम थिए सब सबोई हाल ही वाज वाटर द फायर द ग्लोरी ऑफ लाइफ द ब्यूटी बिलवड ऑल जॉयस फ्रॉम हिम पाणी पसे पाण खे पाणी पसे पाण खे पाणी या महबू पाणी खल के खू 
पाणई ताल बुत जो लायला पाणई ताल बुत जो सो ही उसो हु सो अजल सो अलाव सो पिरी सो पसाव सो वेरी सो वाहरू पड़ा दो सो सद अलाव पड़ा दो सो सद वरु भाई जो जे लही हुआ गही गड बुधण में बथियाओ डिस्ट्रॉयर क्रिएटर एनिमी एंड हेल्पर प्लव्ड इको एंड साउंड ऑल वन फॉलोइंग हिम एंड was sachal sharma sharma Sar- another the trio was called shalati sachal and sami and the trio shalati f- from mid 18th century to uh, early ni- 19th century and sachal and sami both live close to 100 years and they were they were young in 20s when shah latif was there but they had a contact with each other and shah compared to shah latif who was as, as i said was uh, known as the simplicity uh, reincarnated sachal sarmast was a defiant poet and he was in a kind of a revolutionary too he was a def- defiant because he equated truth to supreme being and proclaimed an al haq that i am the truth myself and this common greetings which the followers of sachal even follow today they will say haq maujood sada maujood will be the response which means the truth is truth is prevailing and truth will always prevail he equated sachal equated all the prophets and devotees together i'll i'll uh, i'll recite some of one of his uh, such poems uh, composition and also later on he says people may say i am this person i am that person but i am what i am i am i am him i am i am the real name i am the real supreme myself so there is no difference between supreme being and me so his one of his composition was sachu sai hikro kone shak guman सचू साई हिकड़ो कोने शक गुमान काथई पढ़े पोथियों त काथई पढ़े कुरान काथे ईसा काथे अहमद त काथई हनुमान हैरत मंज हैरान विधई पंजो पान के एल्सवेयर ही सेस नानक लक्ष्मण मेरा नाम और विच मदीने हु फुरकान ओनली वन ओनली वन लॉर्ड नो डाउट और क्वेश्चन एज क्राइस्ट प्रॉफिट और हनुमान then in another composition he he says i'll recite for you ko kiya chave ko kiya chave aa jo hi aaya so hi aaya kiya chave ko kiya chave aa jo hi aaya so hi aaya momin chave ko kafir chave ko la 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 जाहिद नालो जाहिर चवे को शायर चवे को साहिर चवे आओ जो ही आया सो ही आया सम से दिस सम दैट आई एम व्हाट आई एम सम से मुस्लिम सम इनफिडेल आई एम ट्रुथ आफ्टर दैट सामी हु आल्सो एज आई सेड लिव फॉर क्लोज टू 100 इयर्स both sachal and sami passed away in the, just before the british conquered uh, sin sami was in that same way he was known as a incarnation of calmness and placidity in his composition he more or less translated the deep philosophy of vedas and upanishads into simple sindhi language he seldom used the analogy of folklore or any any uh, 
uh, any such thing which was very heavily used by Shah Latif. But it, as I said, it is a simple explanation of Vedantic philosophy, and later on, he combined that with his Sufism also. Two of his composition. One is, in simple words, he, uh, he goes to his guru and he asks, how did this world come about? And the, guru, and the answer he gives is that a guru, uh, the supreme being just turned on himself. So I'll, I'll recite that. Sanso hi kupiyo achi mohinje jiya me Sami chave he sat guru kathau jagat thiyo Puthi dei paana khe saakhiya siddh kayo Are konhe koi biyo jal papoto jal re I had doubts and asked how it all came. He turned around and revealed like a bubble in water. And another, he conveys uh, that all the scriptures, Ved Purana Quran Kav Sabh Me Soi Soot Samjhi Dis Sami Chave Laaye Man Mazbu जिया आकाश घटन में तिये सब में साखी भूत को आत्मरत अवधु समझे हिन्न सुखन के He says that where the Quran and Quran they have the same thing but in the last last line he's he brings on the conception of a holy ghost, Sakhi Bhut, saying that uh, like, like there is a sky behind all the clouds, that's how the holy ghost is behind every living being. So uh, at that time, the Christianity had already come, so he brings that also. But as I said, he explains ev everything in a simple language without uh, the... Uh, other romanticism which is there in other poets. Then we come to the contemporary Sindhi. In 1852, modified Sindhi Arabic script, initiated by the British, was accepted by intellectuals of both communities. And Sindhi became the official language of the region also. Voluminous literature of all categories, both original and translated from English and other languages was, pr was produced and secular in structure for next 50 years. The beginning of 20th century was the rise of nationalist movement and of revival of religious Muslim consciousness. In 1860, Trump compiled the Shah Latif's uh, uh, Rasalo for the first time, later modified by Dr. Gurbakshani, and as I said earlier. And there, there was another prolific writer Kalej, Mirza Kalej Beg, who was of Central Asian origin but born in Sin, and he, he, he wrote in, he wrote fiction, non-fiction, poetry, and um, anything one could think of. And one of his, he also uh, wanted to popularize the vegetables in the Sindhi diet, which were not seldom used. So I have, remember one line of his uh, poems was uh, about tomatoes. He says, Vaha tamata suena yaar a police jehra patka pae bhajin ke to ranga laga hai. And after the, uh, during this period in early 20th century, Sindhi Hindus continued secular poetry with patriotic and social realism themes. There were very large number of writers, generally secular, some religious among both Muslims and Hindus. They excelled in fiction, non-fiction, short stories, novels, essays, and history, and uh, uh, collection of all the old compositions by such Shah Sachal Sami uh, took place in this uh, beginning of the first 40 years of 20th century. Among the poets, Kishinchan Bevas in 1920s uh, broke the tradition of romanticism of, farce, of a Persian type which was creeping in into Sindhi. And also 
he made a big break from only so he composed on sufism too but it largely was his uh, uh, going back to the nature the praise, praising the nature and also social realism so and his poem about nature became the accepted prayer in all the sindhi schools before partition now of course they don't i'll i'll recite that is uh, about nature sab kan tuhi ji sara kudrat wara sab kan tuhi ji sara kudrat wara nirmal jyoti noor nazara nirmal jyoti noor nazara कोटा कोट बनाए धरतियों कोटा कोट बनाए धरतियों सह सह सिज टंडारा कतियों जिन जो अंत न पारा कुदरत वारा जिन जो अंत न पारा कुदरत वारा निर्मल ज्योति नूर नजारा ऑल प्रेस दी क्रिएचर ऑफ नेचर बिनोवलट लाइट enchanting sights his poem on social realism was about pray that poor man's hut meant should not crumble or be destroyed so i'll recite that one of those stanzas ja ahe jaye dad navar sev bal kha thindi nazar bar jagrvi aj khyal kha ओ नो न जै खे आहे को जोखे जंजाल खा हल्की रहे जहामत सोगी संदूकड़ी जैमें गरूर जर न सरासर सगे गड़ी अल्लाह झुरे मशाल गरीबन जी झूपड़ी प्रॉपर्टी नॉट सब्जेक्ट टू मॉर्गेज और बर्गलोरी प्रे लॉट नॉट दिस लेट नॉट दिस हट क्रम्बल no no it is just a gist of it but it's it is the translation is a, the property which is not subject to any inheritance or mortgage and uh, and also uh, there's no security uh, uh, to be t- t- taken care of and there is no egoistic about its uh, value or its uh, economic uh, financial uh, it is just a simple hut meant so, so for the tears that show that your memory yeah. not marking the yes yes oh yes the english translation is only just a gist gist i'm sorry yeah, yeah. no no it is <laughs> then hundraj dukhayal one of his uh, uh, student uh, became the per- most patriotic uh, famous poets of sin Uh, before the independence and partition and his poem poems were as i said patriotic uh, calling on uh, to people to stand up and revolt so he, two lines of his thayo thayo pahinjo raj thayo thayo pahinjo raj drayo drayo dwaryo raj drayo drayo dharyo raj mulko asa jo malik dharya khape na ehdo jado rawaj mulko asa jo malik dharya khape na ehdo jado rawaj thayo thayo pahinjo raj come install your free rule break the foreign rule from 1937 when sind sind separated from the bombay presidency and became a separate province nationalism uh, became a dominant became dominant in sindhi muslim psyche and from 1947 until now sindhi literature in sindh has come to be dominated by generally secular composers writers fiction non fiction and amongst them mohammad ibrahim joyo who is a who is in late 80s now and he has been a pioneer in creating the sindh literary board and sheikh ayaz was a, a poet who spent about 14 15 years in in the pakistani prisons and wrote his famous jail diaries novels and short stories but he is best known as a poet the poet of uh, uh, resurrecting 
Sindhu Desh, and which has become amongst the leftist only in Sindh, uh, then they are uh, very popular. Uh, I shall recite two lines of that. Sindhu Desh Jidharti Tote Pahinjo Sisun Nimaya Miti Mathe Laya Sindhu Desh Jidharti Tote Pahinjo Sisun Nimaya Miti Mathe Laya Kinjara Kankaro Jaratai Kinjara Kankaro Jaratai Toke Chashman Laya Mitti mathe laya Duthub pahinjo, dehub pahinjo Duthub pahinjo, dehub pahinjo Maru shal milaya Mitti mathe laya so, uh, Sorry, it's a, uh, it's a veneration for Sindhu Desh that, uh, that um, dust of your uh, soil I'll put on my head as my decoration. From Kinjar, which is the lake, and, and to the Karanjar, which are the mountains and two ends of uh, Sindh, I put you on my uh, chashma eyes. And the product is ours and the country is ours. So hopefully, all the people who are separated will get together one day. Hundreds of writers of fiction, non-fiction, have been produced on both sides of the border. There have been novelists, short stories writers, dramatists, non-fiction writers, poets, and both countries have now established institution, institutes of Sindhology to preserve archives and conduct research and recovery of old manuscript and art objects. Several academies also exist to encourage and finance writers. Regrettably, in India, even though a large number of uh, writers are there, the readership in Sindhi has declined tremendously. And so it has among the Sindhis who uh, live overseas. Sindhi as a spoken and learning language has very limited clientage in India now and the rest of the world who are outside Sindh. And incidentally, I should mention there's the Institute of Sindhology in Chicago, which uh, concentrates on the study of uh, uh, Sindhu region. Um, and that is run by Mr. G uh, D. L. Gedwani, who is the brother of Bhagwan Gedwani, who wrote the book *Return of the uh, Aryas*, in which he claims the Aryas went from uh, India to all over the world and returned as Aryas in uh, Persia and India. Anyway, so that is uh, now we we have time, so we shall. Recite the Sindhi alphabet. All right. I'll start now. Sindhi has uh, 52 letters. 52 letters in the alphabet, out of which about, uh, out of which 40 are of.